5,300 years ago, a man lay frozen high in the Alps. Utsi, the ice man's body, found in melting ice, opened a cold window into the Copper Age. New DNA tests from his remains reveal wounds, illness, and a far harsher end than first believed. Arrowheads, deep cuts, and old injuries have left scientists piecing together his final hours. Was he a victim of violence, or the Alpine world itself? The mystery of Utsi's death grows darker with every new strand of evidence, and tonight, we retrace his last steps. At Tissenjach, a high pass on the border of Italy and Austria, the ice still carries the memory of storms. Around 3300 BCE, about 5300 years ago, a man came to rest in a shallow gully at roughly 3,210 meters, where wind scours snow into hard drifts. The cold sealed him in place. When a warm late summer in 1991 loosened the surface, hikers glimpsed skin, leather, and the edge of a tool, a copper-bladed axe rare for the Alps at that time. The Utztal Alps gave him a spare tomb but preserved a crowded life. His clothes were stitched from goat and sheep hide, his cloak was woven grass, his shoes layered deerskin, bearskin, and grasses for insulation. Beside him lay a quiver with unfinished arrows and a long yew stave for a bow. Birch bark containers, portable canteens for hot embers, hinted he carried fire between camps. Even before lab work, the scene suggested urgency and exposure. The body was not a simple casualty of weather. A flint-tipped arrow lay lodged in his left shoulder and cuts marked his hands. The mountain kept a record, but it needed reading. To understand how the man in the ice met his end, investigators would have to treat the find as a living case file, bone, tissue, tools, and the frozen sediment around him, opening the way to trace the body's story. Imaging began the translation. CT scans and x-rays revealed an arrowhead embedded near the left shoulder, close to the subclavian artery, an injury that can bleed out in minutes. Bruising on the head and a deep cut across the right palm, likely one to two days old, suggested recent conflict. He had more than 60 tattoos, dark lines near joints and the lower back, which many researchers argue align with pain points rather than decoration. The micro-evidence tightened the clock. Pollen trapped in his digestive tract stacked like a timeline, from valley trees to alpine herbs, implying a rapid ascent in the last day. His stomach held ibex meat and fat, grains of einkorn and charred plant traces, energy-dense food taken not long before death. In the colon, soil scientists and paleoparasitologists found eggs of intestinal worms, an added burden for a man moving at altitude. Gear mapped behavior. The quiver included only two finished arrows and several shafts, and the U bow stave was still being shaped suggesting either haste or interrupted preparation. A copper axe of unusual purity lay beside him, unused in the final struggle but too valuable to abandon. These threads of trauma, diet, and equipment set the stage for genetic work, where DNA would help separate chronic illness from the violence of his last hours. Ancient DNA made the frozen body speak in new ways. A high-coverage genome published in 2023 refined his ancestry. Strong ties to early Anatolian farming populations, little to no steppe-related input, and traits including lactose intolerance and a predisposition to male pattern baldness. His skin was likely darker than long assumed, a reminder that Copper Age Alpine life did not match later European stereotypes. Pathogen DNA added weight to the portrait of strain. Fragments of Helicobacter pylori in his stomach point to a virulent lineage circulating in Eurasia at the time, consistent with chronic gastric stress. Studies also reported sequences of Borrelia burgdorferi, the bacterium behind Lyme disease. While levels and interpretation remain debated, the signal suggests an immune system already working hard as he climbed. Uniparental markers traced family history into deep time. His Y-chromosome haplogroup sits within G2A, common among Neolithic farmers in Europe, and his maternal line falls within a rare branch of K1. The genetics do not tell us who shot him, but they sketch his world. 
a farmer hunter moving through highland passes with infections and inherited risks layered onto the stress of cold and altitude, pressures that framed the weapons found in his body and at his side. The wound was the turning point. Forensic trajectory work indicates the flint-tipped arrow entered from behind at an angle, lodging near the left shoulder and likely severing the subclavian artery. Massive internal bleeding would follow quickly. A small cranial injury and traces consistent with brain swelling appear on scans. Many researchers argue the head trauma came as he fell, though whether a blow preceded the fall remains debated. The axe beside him complicates the scene. The blade, about 99% pure copper, was cast from metal whose isotopic signature matches ores in southern Tuscany, far to the southwest. In a world where stone still dominated, carrying such a tool signaled status, connections, or both. That it remained at the body suggests a hurried flight by attackers or a death so rapid that nothing was taken. Stone tells its own roots. Chert in his toolkit matches sources in the Monte Lucini near Lake Garda, indicating exchange or travel over 100 kilometers away. Violence then unfolded within networks that moved metal, stone, and people across passes. The question becomes not just who fired the arrow, but where the last journey began and why he was on the ridge at all, answers that sit in the hours before his collapse. Pollen grains act like signposts. In the lower gut, hop hornbeam and hazel pollen point to time spent in foothill forests. Higher up the tract, alpine grasses and conifers signal a rapid shift up slope within the final day. His last meal, ibex meat rich in fat, einkorn fragments, and herb residues, was taken only hours before death, fuel for a strenuous climb toward the pass. Route studies link the fine spot to valleys that funnel into the ridge, the Schnallstall and the Etch, Adige Corridor. Strontium and oxygen isotopes from tooth enamel place his upbringing in the Isaac Valley of South Tyrol, suggesting that these were familiar mountains. Yet his quiver held only two finished arrows, and his bow remained unfinished. Whether he fled a fight, scouted a crossing, or tried to beat worsening weather, evidence suggests he moved fast and light into thin air. As clouds built and wind scraped the snowfields, he took shelter in a rocky gully near Tissenjoch. The position would shield him from gusts but leave little room to maneuver. There, the arrow found him. What followed? Collapse dwindling breath, the first drift of snow, set the conditions for a body to freeze hard, and a mystery to harden with it, awaiting the final accounting in the ice. The end was fast and unforgiving. An arrow from behind likely cut a major vessel, causing hemorrhagic shock within minutes. A head injury followed as he fell. Wind pressed spindrift over him, Snow and cold sealed flesh, clothes, and tools into a natural time capsule at roughly 3,210 netras. Entombed by shifting ice, he remained there until 1991, when Melt finally exposed the ridge's oldest witness. In the lab, each line of evidence stitched details back into a life. Isotopes tie his childhood to the Asak Valley. The copper axe points to metallurgical links reaching southern Tuscany. Shirt traces connect to the Monte Lucini. DNA reveals an Anatolian farmer-rich ancestry, lactose intolerance, a tendency toward baldness, and infections that strained him long before the final climb. Even his tattoos, more than 60 marks, hint at a long battle with pain. What killed him is not in doubt, a projectile wound and the mountain's cold. Why it happened remains debated. Interpersonal conflict, a raid turned lethal, or an ambush on a pass. New genetic reads and reanalyses continue to sharpen the picture, each strand pulling the Copper Age into clearer focus. In Ussie's frozen end, we see a world of exchange, risk, and resilience, and how the ice, once a tomb, became a witness that still answers when asked. <laughs>